Um, I wanted to offer a couple of points about the unconventional revolution, specifically from a national security vantage point, which is generally how I look at the world. Um, I think in the broadest sense, it's very difficult to draw a straight line between the unconventional revolution and specific national security implications, at least to date. But it does raise a number of interesting questions and potential challenges. Um, even before the events of the last month to six weeks, uh, it was clear unconventionals complicate Russia's economic and therefore domestic political uh, situation. And that raises the question of how strong or weak do, does the US want Russia to be? And to what degree do unconventionals affect our ability to influence that outcome? Um, I think the rise of unconventionals also likely complicates economic development in some already unstable areas of the world. Perhaps most significantly in areas that uh, we have less direct national interest, and so that suggests that there'll be increased pressure on policymakers to potentially respond to unrest in areas where we may be disinclined to do so. Um, as the study points out, the shale gale does not fundamentally change our national interests, but it has made people both domestically and overseas uh, believe that our interests are different or will become different in the future, which has in turn created a significant challenge for US policymakers. Um, from a purely defense perspective, I think broadly speaking, the unconventional revolution is consistent with the policy of Asian rebalance, but the competitiveness problems that it poses for uh, Europe suggests that European countries will continue to face greater economic strains or great economic strains, and that in turn will affect their military capabilities and capacity. Um, and unconventionals do little to affect the, uh, alleviate existing strains in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, finally, some have asked whether American unconventional riches uh, should affect the Defense Department's thinking about the need for um, greater uh, energy efficiency and uh, pursuit of alternative energy supply sources. Um, the, the biggest imperative for that policy priority obviously lies in the challenges of logistics and ensuring uh, vulnerable long supply lines, which domestic supply does little to uh, influence. So that challenge remains. But uh, those are just a few of my broad thoughts about some of the work we've done over the last year. I want to turn it over to Sarah for some additional things and then hopefully have time for some brief questions before moving on to the rest of the program. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And uh, so, you know, one of the things we thought we would do in sort of batting cleanup after our presentation is, is sort of uh, respond to some of the, 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 the comments that we sort of, you know, didn't get to put into our, sort of our presentation, but we do think are really important and, is, uh, and are very much highlighted in a lot of the rest of the work. Um, and, you know, the first is, you know, not to sort of dampen our own, uh, our own parade here, but I think at the outset of this project, lots of folks thought that unconventional oil and gas, both in terms of its impact on the energy space, which is definitely hugely impactful, would have a very similar sort of impact on the geopolitical and national security space. And we found that, you know, while, while a lot of what's happening in the energy space is very important, it isn't having sort of overwhelming impacts, right? There's no region of the world where it has fundamentally upended sort of the geopolitical dynamics that were already there. But what has happened is that it's a very concrete, interesting, and unexpected vector that has come into a very geopolitically fluid environment where people are looking for structure, they're weighing you know, and balancing relative power one, one against one another. And so we found through all of the regional studies that we did and the work we were doing with a lot of our colleagues, which is very challenging for me because I'm more an energy wonk than, uh, than, a, than a foreign policy person, um, that people were sort of clinging to energy as evidence of something changing and, and really sort of asking that question about whether something was changing. And, and in this kind of environment, that was a, that's a very important thing, right? And so uh, we found even in places where we could ex readily explain why the energy balance really hadn't shifted too dramatically, um, in geopolitical terms, in perception terms, that it was very important in sort of reshaping people's thinking. And so. Um, that's something that for me is sort of one of the main sort of takeaways of this study. The second, and now I will be sort of an energy uh, uh, wonk of sorts, is you know, oil is different from gas. And a lot of the reports that we looked at that sort of did this, you know, look at you know, what happens with, uh, with the, the onset of tide oil uh, uh, production and, um, and shale gas production, 
uh, looked at one or the other and, and, and sort of applied a geopolitical lens to one or the other. These are very different resource trends uh, and they're working on different timelines and, and sort of, you know, uh, geophysically, they're different things as well, but geopolitically, they're also different things. And so we spend a good bit of time in the report trying to talk a little bit about how gas is different in oil and then what that actually means uh, for the potential geopolitical implications. Uh, and then finally, you know, I think that uh, it's probably accentuated because of, as Marin said, the discussion that we're having about, you know, the, the Ukraine crisis and what's happening uh, with, with the United States relationship with Russia. Uh, we're getting lots of questions, again, about, you know, whether this surge in, in U.S. Uh, uh, gas production can be used as a tool of foreign policy in our current uh, uh, situation. Um, and, and, and as a result, we basically, in, in, the, in the report, argue that, you know, energy is not a very well-directable tool of foreign policy, and you're very likely to overplay your hand if you try and use it as such, but it is a fundamental tenant of energy security, which... And you, when you think about sort of international structures, free and fair and functioning markets is one of the things that could lead to a great deal more stability. And so um, we, we think that, that we're not trying to be critical of, uh, of the administration or Congress or anybody else. And, and we think it's a very valid point that, you know, this is an energy revolution that has happened in the United States over a very short period of time. We are absorbing what it means and trying to construct a policy response, but that takes time as well. And we think that that's a, you know, also a very sort of important point as we sort of talk about what we should or shouldn't be doing sort of in the, in the current day uh, context. So um, if I could just offer, offer one last point uh, that I think is important. One of the things as a non-energy wonk, uh, that having spent the last year looking hard at this, that I hadn't appreciated was the degree of uncertainty about the future trajectory of the unconventional revolution, not only here but, but globally. And uh, that I think is something that is not very well reflected in the broader uh, policy conversation. I think certainly not when it gets uh, translated through to the national security conversation. There's an expectation that uh, there's a fairly linear trend to be expected and, and the degree of uncertainty around that, again, was something I hadn't appreciated, but I think is hugely important as we think about how we want, might want to go forward in this space. So um, that was a, a major uh, learning point for me during the course of this work. Mm -hmm. We may have time for just uh, maybe one or two questions, if there are any. David. They're all reading your report. Okay. David, there's two over here. Okay. Do we have Mike? Uh, on Marin's last point, Annie. could you talk a little about the technology, the technology of the unconventional oil production, the tight oil production, and what you're talking about? I think you're talking about a relationship to price, the economics. That what happens if the price doesn't stay at $100? What happens if it goes to 80 or What happens if it crashes to 40 uh, And Sarah? Con contrast to, to, to <laughs> the conventional oil, which is produced pr pretty steadily once you find it. Right. And if I can ask another question to put on the table, I'm curious whether, thinking of Keystone XL, and the inability of two NATO allies in North America to reach a resolution over five years, whether just this process defect, as I see it, uh, has geopolitical significance. Mm -hmm. Over to the energy wonk. <laughs> we talk a bunch about, uh, about sort of um, price and sort of technology evolution within the unconventional space. Again, I think this is one of those areas where we're learning about the cost curve, improving efficiency, improving recovery rates, all that kind of stuff. And we've, you know, separately and apart from this study, we've done other studies that are looking just at the resource base, the producibility, the economics of it. And, you know, we did a study two years ago. It's out of date today, right? I mean, it's moving so fast and people are doing things in different ways and the economics are changing. And so that's a, it's a, it's sort of a day-to-day, -day, you know, exercise on, on, on that question. Um, I do think there is a lot of confidence that we've got a lot of gas. It is producible at, you know, uh, at, at, a, at a very reasonable price threshold. Um, the question for us is, you know, the learning curve on tight oil is, is a little bit further behind than it is on, uh, on shale gas. And all I can say is 
we, we're certainly revising upward those estimates every single year, just like we did uh, shale gas. So it looks like it might be a little bit you know, more complicated to get out of the ground. It's a, it's a somewhat technical discussion. The, the place where there's you know, uh, ample amounts of uncertainty is in other countries around the world that also have you know, this resource base. And, and quite frankly, other countries that have conventional resource bases that they weren't producing in the most economically optimal way. Right, and so, so how countries respond and what they do with their own resource base and what they're capable of doing is a huge question. Uh, on the Keystone one, we didn't take it on directly, uh, only because, uh, from my vantage point, we're talking about it all the time. Um, what I would say, though, is there are lots of sound arguments uh, that, that we make that, that talk about you know, where security comes from, energy security comes from for the United States, and it has a lot to do with being able to get uh, infrastructure permitted in a timely fashion, being able to spend money, uh, investing in projects so they come online on time when you're going to need them. Um, and, and we also say that you know, the unconventional revolution doesn't solve the climate change crisis, which quite frankly, uh, you know, there is a view that most of the, what's holding us up on sort of the Keystone XL question is a climate change question. So unconventionals doesn't solve that for us either, so it probably doesn't solve that sort of you know, uh, very narrow debate. Uh, we got a couple over here. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, in the late 1990s, Putin did a late PhD dissertation where he described how Russia could use its energy resources to link uh, and compel countries in the near abroad to more or less conform to his view. And of course, we've seen recently an example of this in Ukraine. But the Swedish defense ministry uh, about five years ago detailed dozens and dozens of instances where Russia has, in fact, used its energy to intimidate and, and, and force political concessions from its uh, veneer abroad. What, if anything, can be done about this broader problem? Uh, we might want to punt that one to our uh, geo, regional to our regional experts that are coming <coughs> next. Um, I think, uh, obviously, that's the topic of the day. But I, I do think it's better to left to some of our regional experts. But yeah, I, you know, when I'm, we'll be very humble in the room where we've got some some real expertise on on the question of you know what Russia is doing, why it does it, and how you manage that. I, I will say though. Um, there is a question of whether or not you know, Russia is in a fundamentally different position today, one, because of their interdependence on markets with Europe, right? There's, there is, a, there is a, a cost benefit analysis that comes with cutting off energy relationships with Europe. There is a cost benefit analysis that comes to doing simply what they've done thus far and realizing that the investors around the world look at them differently. Right? I mean, they're not in economically the best position in the world. It's not you know, terrible either. And, and there's lots of people better capable here of answering whether that matters to them or not. But you know, there, there is also an argument to be made that being linked in you know, to the rest of the world with economic ties, energy being one of them, um, gives more pause than it does leverage uh, when it comes to overt you know, actions of strength and, and, uh, and uh, and bullying. So uh, I, I have a very unpopular view that maybe something that's keeping Ukraine safe these days is energy. <laughs> um, but maybe it's causing us all to focus on it in, a, in sort of a new and different way because we realize those trade ties are so important. So we'll take one more from Pepin. Pepin Ore from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The key question as far as a number of us are concerned is, is this an American revolution or is it a global revolution? And that's, that really will define a lot of what we are talking about. Sarah was actually touching on this, but to what extent have you, has your study really gone into this particular issue? Because certainly if you have a shale revolution or in, in China, certainly the parameters of Chinese foreign policy will change pretty dramatically. As, as one possible consequence, and there are lots of others. Can you comment on this briefly, please? Yeah, we actually, and this is a, thank you. That was a very good uh, opportunity for me to thank uh, another person in particular, Tatiana Mitrova from the Russian Academies of Science, who uh, very graciously allowed us to utilize some scenario planning that she had done on 
different scenarios, what would happen if there was a shale gas, it was more unconventionals, which is a broader term, but an unconventional breakthrough or failure around the world or a status quo position, right? And what it allowed us to do was not really dive into the question of who's gonna produce, how much, how fast, and those kinds of things. There's very good studies, um, basin by basin studies that people are sort of looking at and uh, that, that do that. However, what it did allow us to do is have some scenarios to play with that looked at what the geopolitical implications would be. If you were very, very optimistic or you were you know, not necessarily as optimistic. And we thought, you know, you know, by far and away, the country that sort of benefits from a geostrategic standpoint the most is the United States, obviously, right? Because it, you know, in those situations, we look like we are you know, to be advantaged from our other, you know, the position we were previously in. In a failure scenario, we sort of looked uh, like we were, we were back in sort of a tough spot. Um, China does well in, 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 uh, in sort of the high case scenarios as well. It's not a game changer for their foreign policy though, right? I mean, when you look at their trajectory of energy demand going forward, more supply of any one source is a great thing, but it isn't necessarily a game changer, right? And so, but it does sort of matter sort of, you know, how these things happen and which country they happen first and, and whether it's oil versus gas and things like that. So there are, we do go through that to a, a, a great deal of detail in, uh, in the report. But did you wanna? I, add I would just add that I think one of the other things that was important in terms of how this is reflected today is again, getting back to this point of uncertainty, it's, and uh, interestingly, most of the implications I would, I would characterize, most of the implications to date have not so much been based in the reality of the unconventional revolution to date, but about expectations about what's to come in the future. And those uh, opinions are so diverse, uh, that's what's in large part fueling some of the additional uncertainty. Um, and so people can pick their scenario based on whatever data they choose to, to think is most relevant. Um, and lots of people are picking different ones. And so that's creating instability and lack of clarity. Uh, that's the characterization of today. And, and I think as the technology develops, as the reality starts to play out, that will uh, tighten the shot group, so to speak, uh, with, with a much, you'll be able to predict much more clearly uh, what the implications, specific implications might be. I know there's a lot more questions, but we've basically set up the rest of the day to be able to dig deep into each one of these aspects. So, um, but I, I just, before, before we sort of turn it over uh, back to uh, Ambassador Hills, I just wanted to say thank you very much to the Smith Richardson Foundation who made this work possible. Um, you have lots of people to thank. You'll see our entire panel of regional scholars later today that we wanna thank. Uh, we wanna thank our, our, our contributing authors, uh, Michelle Melton, Jane Nakano, uh, Frank Ferrastro and Andrew Metric. And I know everyone always says, gee, this report would not have been possible without you know, somebody. It actually would not have happened without Molly Walton, uh, who's <laughs> standing in the back right there. So just wanna say thank you to everybody who uh, puts all the sort of the sweat into a year long effort and we really appreciate it and hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.